Okay, we'll start with this. Jake Paul via social media posted this video with a caption that reads, Amanda sent this to my partner in confidence, but I have to share it. I'm so proud of how you stepped up last night and almost knocked out your much bigger opponent. Don't hate me, Kisa. Um, obviously, it's the day after the fight. <laughs> I ate last night. I've been drinking water. And I want to show you how much I weigh. I'm not a legitimate. I'm 135 pounder, 126 featherweight. <laughs> Okay, I gained two ounces on the weigh in. <laughs> two ounces heavier than your weigh in. That is what it is. This caption this video is being received with mixed reviews. I guess what Jake is implying is that Amanda Serrano was the naturally smaller fighter the night of the fight, taking on. Is he saying that she was at a disadvantage? Sounds like it. IBF bantamweight champion Ebony Bridges chimed in and said, Amanda did an amazing job. Don't worry about the weight. She was stronger, anyways. Let's not forget Amanda has cut hard to go win world titles in super flyweight and bantam, and then boasted about piling on 20 pounds for fight day to come in a lot bigger than her naturally small opponents. And her belt, her first belt, her first belt was at 135 pounds, and she's also fought as high as 140 pounds. Guys, just stop with the weight talk. You're taking away from an amazing fight. Maybe Jake Paul doesn't know this stuff. That Amanda's no newbie to the lightweight division. She's been there before. Years before. Before Katie Taylor even debuted as a professional boxer back in 2014, the first alphabet title Amanda Serrano ever won was in the lightweight division, WBO title. She won her very first alphabet title there eight years ago. T-Street Controversy of Fight View 360 here on YouTube stated, Amanda has weighed in seven times above the 130-pound limit. 12 fights officially at 135 pounds, lightweight. Now she's the smaller fighter? Come on. You know, there didn't seem to be much between them at the weigh-in. Tail of the tape. They seemed evenly matched. They did. The actual fight, the fight itself, you saw that Amanda Serrano retains her power in the lightweight division. It might not have been enough to stop Katie Taylor, but she's not pillow fested. No. She's no pillow puncher. You can't sell people that Katie Taylor is so much bigger than Amanda Serrano. Not without having that same logic turned against Amanda by those in the know. Those who realize Amanda has cut as low as... She's fought as low as super flyweight against a naturally smaller woman than she is. I think that's what both Ebony Bridges and T-Street control are trying to communicate that you can't sell Big Bad Katie is so much bigger than Amanda without highlighting that Amanda was so much bigger than some of her previous opponents, naturally smaller women than she is, like Eva Voraberger, who she faced at Super Flyweight for a vacant WBO title. I think what they're saying is don't make Amanda out to be a victim. It just comes off as tactless and unnecessary. Both fighters fought their hearts out. Both gave a great showing. There really isn't much between them in terms of the tale of the tape, and Amanda Serrano herself is no stranger to the lightweight division, so don't make Amanda out to be a victim. It really isn't necessary, and there weren't any losers on Saturday anyway. Even if Katie Taylor was awarded the decision, a lot of people are high on both fighters right now. There's no need to vilify one for the other. You know, Jake's the one who posted the video. It's not coming to us by way of Amanda Serrano's own social media. It's coming to us by way of Jake Paul social media and maybe Jake Paul himself doesn't know these facts and stats. He doesn't know these statistics. He doesn't realize that the first title Amanda ever won was in the lightweight division. She's no newbie to that weight. So if he's trying to vilify Katie Taylor or I don't know, paint her out to be some kind of a weight bully, that same logic would have to apply to Amanda, who's fought well below featherweight, the division where she says, You're saying Katie had a weight advantage, then so have you in many of your fights. If that is somehow intended to diminish Katie Taylor's victory this past weekend, like I said, none of this is necessary because anybody that saw that fight is likely high on both fighters, and the fight itself presents a unique opportunity for Amanda Serrano that Jake Paul, as her promoter, needs to capitalize on. Madison Square Garden, by way of their social media, announced that there were 19,000 people in attendance for the fight. Boxing scribe Dake Jonovan tweeted that it was a sellout. They put all the asses in all the seats they had for somebody to sit in. I don't quite know how true that is since Madison Square Garden's capacity for a boxing match 
is a little over 20,000. Better still, a lot of people showed up. A lot of people were excited. The event was a success. I'd wager that the viewing figures for this fight... They're not out yet, but I'd wager that the metrics are fantastic. I don't want to take anything away from Shakur Stevenson's unification match with Oscar Valdez and his performance, but let's be honest. The fight this weekend that took place this weekend, the fight that everybody's buzzing about, it's really not Stevenson versus Valdez. It's Taylor versus Serrano. And this presents a unique opportunity for Jake, as Amanda's promoter, to... I said it in my previous video. Her next move doesn't have to be about Katie Taylor. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be about going to Ireland and fighting Katie in her neck of the woods. It doesn't have to be about a rematch. It can very well be about her undisputed campaign at 126 pounds. And based on the viewing figures, the metrics, the gate revenue, the reaction, the reception that the fight got this past weekend, that off Amanda and Katie Taylor's names alone... The fight was a big hit. The fight did exceptionally well, and that now shows that Amanda... Amanda Serrano has drawing power, whereas before she catered to a much smaller, obscure audience, she wasn't yet a well-known fighter. This changed that, and you can use this, these metrics, to get her a good deal at a showtime or perhaps a DAZN, who Jake Paul seems to have a good working relationship with, to where the centerpiece isn't capping off the deal with a Katie Taylor fight. Perhaps the centerpiece is seeing Amanda Serrano crowned as an undisputed champion. You can negotiate for more money. I don't think you can get a seven figures a fight, not seven. Not for every fight, because not every fight is the same scale, the same size as a Katie Taylor fight, but maybe you can get her. I don't know, $300,000 a fight? Maybe even four for a unification match with a Sarah Mahfoud or an Erica Cruz. Staging fights in the tri-state area where the bulk of Amanda's fans are located. There's a number of them. The metrics this fight got, that's the game changer. That's the argument that really wasn't there before for Amanda Serrano's case to earn higher pay. Well, now you have a credible argument that shows you can draw. And not every fight is going to be a seven-figure fight. No, not every fight. Not every fight is going to get the same reaction and attention that a Kaylee Taylor fight got. But there's enough of an argument there that you can negotiate for good prices, better prices than you've been getting so far. And I think that's what Jake needs to focus on more than the contracted weight of the fighters, so on and so forth. As a promoter, there's a unique opportunity there for Jake to get Amanda back out there on what is perhaps his next in the ring appearance, set to go down August 12th. Pin down either a Sarah Mahfoud or Eric Crow's unification match. Get her back on track, back in the winner's bracket, because I've no doubts she'd knock both of those girls' blocks off. She would. Focus on promoting, since you're a promoter. It's your record now, ain't it? In men's super middleweight news, you might have heard by now Queensbury's official announcement in reference to Zach Parker versus Demetrius Andrade. Queensbury promotions have today been informed that Demetrius Andrade has sustained a shoulder injury, which has forced him to withdraw from his scheduled interim WBO super middleweight title fight with Zach Parker at Pride Park Derby on the 21st of May. It is with great regret that the decision has been made to postpone the event until the extent of the injury is fully established. A further update will be released in the coming days with a revised fight date and information for ticket buyers. Is this the second Frank Warren show that's been called off? Not that long ago, unbeaten up and comer Raven Chapman was supposed to be making her Queensbury Promotions debut on a Queensbury show that was eventually moved, and now we see they're having more or less the same luck with this show. So things are back to normal with old fish eyes. Seems they are. Felt like we were in the twilight zone there for a second. Frank Warren's beating up matchroom for purse bids, staging shows at Wembley. You know, Fury versus White. Queensbury doesn't normally do shows that size. And it's not a secret that Queensbury today is not as big a promotional outfit with as many fighters as deep a stable many resources as Matchroom has. Seems like things are back to normal at Queensbury. These kinds of cancellations and postponements are customary, have become synonymous with Queensbury promotions, Frank Warren, Old Fish Eyes, over the years. You can't really blame him. The story is Demetrius got injured. Like I said, it's not unusual for a Queensbury promotion show to experience technical difficulties for one reason or another. It's not unusual to see a Queensbury show get cancelled and or postponed. It happens for a variety of reasons, but the point is, is that it happens. It's happening right now. A little over a week ago, happened then. Demetrius Andrade's maiden voyage to the super middleweight division has hit a snag. It has hit a snafu. I won't lie to you. Whenever I see this kind of stuff going on, fighter gets injured. 
the skeptic in me, the cynic. I always wonder if the fighter's not faking an injury because something else has come along. There are any variety of reasons to pull out of a fight. Perhaps a better fight, a better opportunity has opened up. Perhaps behind closed doors there are other conversations going on for something more favorable. I don't know how Demetrius Andre, underneath it all, really felt about boxing on a Queensbury promotion show against the Queensbury promotions fighter. And that Zach Parker fight, in spite of Demetrius not being a big name, a very big name, he's still a bigger name, still has more of a name than Zach Parker does. We'll see if this fight actually takes place. Or if this snag, if this snafu doesn't result in the fight collapsing altogether to where it doesn't happen and both fighters go their separate ways. This was Demetrius Andre's attempt to become the WBO's interim champion at 168 pounds in pursuit of their full title. I don't for a second. Didn't, I should say. I didn't think winning this fight would get him a Canelo fight. The winner of this fight would be the mandatory challenger for Canelo Alvarez's full WBO title at super middleweight, but I didn't for a second think that the winner of this fight would actually get Canelo Alvarez in the ring. What I figured is that at minimum, if Demetrius can win this fight, he'll be in position to be elevated to full WBO champion once Canelo Alvarez vacates all those alphabet titles. That's what I figured. At which point, he can enter into a new deal with a matchroom, for example, as a reigning WBO champion, reigning three division champion overall, or maybe he takes his business elsewhere. Maybe he goes to a top rank. Maybe he goes to the PBC. What I figured is he's trying to get his hands on a belt. Even if it's not likely that he gets Canelo Alvarez in the ring, he's trying to get his hands on a belt so he can negotiate a new multi-fight contract with one of these promotional outfits that are out there. And, you know, part of me still wonders, is the guy really injured? I mean, the guy getting injured, it's not that it's far-fetched, it's just that on the other side of it... Sometimes there's more to things than meets the eye. And I don't know, we'll see if this fight actually does get rescheduled. Finally, on the heels of his big win this past weekend, Shakur Stevenson stated, My game plan was to beat the whole team. Valdez, Canelo, and Reynoso. WBO Super Featherweight World Champion Shakur Stevenson outboxed and outfoxed. WBC Champion Oscar Valdez via a unanimous decision Saturday evening in front of 10,000 fans at the MGM Grand Garden Arena. He did what he had to do to win the fight. Valdez said. He's a great fighter. His speed is there. Power is there. He was just the better fighter tonight. Overall, a great fighter. I knew from the moment this fight was announced that Shakur would win on points. I knew from the moment that this fight was announced that it was simply a stylistic matchup that did not favor Oscar Valdez's base style. Put simply, it was a bad style matchup for him, and I think, regardless of who was in his corner, he was always going to lose to Shakur Stevenson. It was always going to be this way. Making this about Eddie Reynoso is pure farce. Could have had Manny Robles in his corner, Joel Diaz. Hell, he could have had Ray Arcel in there. It was always going to end this way. It was always going to be Shakur Stevenson on points because Oscar's base style and his characteristics as a fighter, he just ain't got it for this kind of guy. When you're dealing with a really good pure boxer, you need a really good pressure fighter. And Oscar, in spite of his explosivity and his punching power, he's not an according to Hoyle pressure fighter. What he is, what he is really, is a boxer puncher. A boxer who uses the boxing to implement the punching. He is a puncher. He's a boxer puncher. He's not a pressure fighter. He's not a pressure guy. And in order to discombobulate a really skilled, educated, pure boxer, you need a real rough and rugged, grade A level pressure fighter. There ain't no grade A pressure fighters at 130 pounds at this time. You could argue that WBO featherweight champion, Emmanuel Navarrete, is a pretty good pressure fighter, but what he ain't is a super featherweight. What he ain't is a 130 pound fighter. He might be on the level at feather, but what about super feather? This really ain't about trainers. This ain't about who's in Oscar's corner. Afterwards, Stevenson proclaimed that his victory was not only over Valdez, but over close friend Saul Canelo Alvarez and their mutual trainer, Eddie Reynoso. Stevenson said, this victory means everything. I told y'all what I was going to do. I said I'm going to beat Valdez, Canelo, and Eddie Reynoso. So that was my game plan. Beat the whole team, and I feel good about it. Much respect to them, but that was my game plan. I want to collect all the belts at 130 pounds and become undisputed. I deserve to be a superstar, so that's what I got to do, and we'll see if that happens. We've actually broached that subject. Kenichi Ogawa with well, the reigning IBF champion who's with Matchroom, Roger Gutierrez, who I understand is supposed to be with Golden Boy Promotions. We'll see if they can get those fights over the line. He just had to mention Canelo Alvarez. Beating Oscar ain't got a goddamn fucking thing to do with Canelo Alvarez because Oscar Valdez 
Ain't the carbon copy of Canelo Alvarez. Some people have taken this as a knock on Eddie Reynoso. And hey, listen, if you want to do that, you can do that. But if Eddie Reynoso is supposed to be a bad trainer for Oscar Valdez losing to Shakur, what does that make Derek James for Marcus Brown losing to Artur better be? Oh, you guys didn't know Derek James was in his corner for that fight? Derek James, who also happens to train Errol Spence Jr. And because he trains Errol Spence Jr., you got a lot of guys singing his praises. He's supposed to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, not in better be versus Brown he wasn't. If Oscar Valdez losing to Shakur is supposed to be an indictment against Eddie Reynoso's abilities as a trainer, the same would then have to apply to Derek James in the Brown versus Better B fight. That's the way that works. But these guys, they can never keep the same energy across the board. What a fucking stupid. In any event, Shakur Stevenson says it was his plan to beat Oscar Valdez and the whole team, really. Canelo, Eddie Reynoso. Well, we know full well what Shakur's plans are moving forward. He wants to unify. He wants to become the super featherweight division's undisputed champion. And let's see if he can. I favor him to win a fight with Kenichi Ogawa. Well, I favor him to win a fight with Roger Gutierrez. I think the real issue here is he may be on borrowed time as a 130-pound fighter. At least in some circles, that's what people think because he didn't quite make the weight on the first try. Shakur Stevenson has very generous physical dimensions for a super featherweight. and He's young. His body is still growing. So I don't know how many more fights he's got left in him as a super featherweight, though we'll see. And I welcome that proposition, him shooting for undisputed. Let's see if it can't happen. As far as Oscar, listen, Oscar lost to a really good fight fucking fighter on Saturday. Well, I'll tell you right now, he could easily see himself becoming a champion again at 130 pounds. Same way I'd pick Shakur Stevenson to beat Kenichi Ogawa or Roger Gutierrez, the same applies to Oscar Valdez. I'd pick Oscar to beat those guys too. I figure... We're a couple months out from Oscar's next fight. You know, he hasn't fucking retired. The fight on Saturday wasn't a particularly physically taxing fight to where he took a lot of punches, took a lot of punishment. The kind of fight that takes years off a fighter's career. No, he lost a boxing match. A cerebral one against a cerebral fighter. And he can rebound off of that and continue to sell tickets and win titles. I mean, it's not the end of Oscar Valdez by any stretch of the imagination. The only guy that could have did that to Oscar Valdez is Shaquille Stevenson. There's no shame in that. We could see Oscar return to his winning ways in his very next fight. Small setback.